This is Audible. Audible Studios presents Warrior. Written by Nick Webb. Performed by Greg Tremblay. Chapter 1 New Dublin. Air Sector. Planetary Command Center. Governor Wolfram wrung his hands nervously. Sweat beaded on his shiny forehead, but he didn't even bother wiping it. Power was being diverted away from luxuries like air conditioning to more useful things like planetary shielding and orbital plasma particle beams. They were coming. And fast, he noted, watching the flurry of large dots on the tactical readout, each indicating a massive swarm carrier, all likely full of thousands of fighters rapidly approaching the inner system defenses. Any response yet from CENTCOM? He barked at the admiral, huddled with his commanders near the tactical station. From his tight smile and furrowed brow, Governor Wolfram could tell the admiral was annoyed. No, sir. We only just sent out the metaspace distress call an hour ago. We're expecting a response any moment now. Admiral Asbill resumed the coordination of the new Dublin planetary fleet defenses. Wolfram nodded and turned back to the tactical readout nearby. Ten ships. Ten. The fleet that had attacked Earth just over two months ago had numbered ten, too. A first wave of six, followed closely by four more. In all the swarm incursions since that battle, they'd only sent in smaller strike forces, now that they knew Earth knew how to fight back. Two ships here, three there, always striking at smaller settlements on fringe worlds, where they were assured a quick victory, and a sharp, devastating raid before they melted away, disappearing to whatever star systems they were originating from. But New Dublin was not on the periphery, and ten ships meant they were coming for blood. This was the real deal. He wrung his hands again and watched as the last defense outpost, about halfway out to the nearest planet, a handful of automated laser turrets mounted to a smattering of small asteroids orbiting their sun, disappeared from the tactical readout, and the flurry of large dots resumed their course to New Dublin. Less than an hour away. There was no hope. If CENTCOM was only now receiving and responding to the metaspace distress call, there would never be enough time to dispatch a rescue force. They were doomed. In one hour, with ten swarm ships incoming, there was no way any city or town on New Dublin would survive. Their planetary defense fleet was simply no match for that much firepower. He'd often wondered why the swarm came at a planet with conventional inertial thrusters, rather than Q-jump all the way into a system. Q-jumping would give their targets far less time to assemble and organize any sort of defense. But Admiral Asbill, the IDF commander in charge of the new Dublin force, assured him it was not because of any sort of technical shortcomings on the swarm's part. No, he believed they did it to sow fear and terror in their victims. Let them see you coming for hours. Let them stew in their own juices, painfully aware that their end was coming very, very soon. Let them run around in a frenzy, inciting confusion and distress in the population, allowing for maximum disorder and mayhem and destruction when the swarm finally arrived. Why would the swarm do this? Why would they care? Nobody knew. Nobody seemed to know anything about them, as far as he could tell. How could you fight an enemy you knew nothing about? The blood drained from his face as a new dot suddenly appeared on the tactical screen, just a hundred thousand kilometers from New Dublin. Damn, maybe they had changed their tactics. Were they sending in an advance warship to soften them up before the main body of their fleet arrived? The new dot swooped in terribly fast toward a low orbit. It was massive. The energy readings coming off the ship indicated it was charging weapons and preparing for a fight. Wolfram's stomach tensed. The end would come sooner rather than later, it seemed. He heard a whoop off to the side and snapped his head toward the officer who'd made the sound, bouncing excitedly at his station. The comm station. Admiral! It's the warrior! It's Granger himself! Admiral Asbill's face immediately transformed from that of a grim, harried commander to an expression of something Governor Wolfram had not seen in quite some time. Hope. Amazing. Wolfram muttered. He's managed to assemble his strike force and get here already. But where are his other ships? Admiral Asbill shrugged. Patch him through. A few moments later, the officer at Calm nodded. 
You're on, Admiral. We've got a visual, too. This is Admiral Asbel of the New Dublin Planetary Command. That you, Granger? They all turned to the view screen covering half of one of the walls. An image of an older man, his face lined and dark bags sagging under his eyes, snapped onto the screen. And in spite of the lines and scars and obvious signs of months of battle, he was smiling. Good to see you, Asbel. I understand you're in need of some assistance. Admiral Asbel gave a hollow laugh. Yeah, you could say that. Granger's smile widened. Well then, let's get this party started. I'd like to send one of my people down to you to help coordinate and integrate with operations on the warrior. You've got your planetary defense fleet assembled, I presume? We're going to need them. Asbel hesitated. Captain, where's your strike force? They're coming in right behind you. Granger shook his head. Oddly enough, though, his smile deepened. Governor Wolfram felt his stomach tighten. No fleet. The swarm is putting us through the ringer today. Three separate incursions. I've sent my fleet on to the Johannesburg sector to deal with the four swarm ships there, and Admiral Zingano from CENTCOM is personally dealing with a swarm raid in the Centauri system with the Strike Force based at Seoul. Asbel's back stiffened. Am I to understand, sir, that you're it? No one else is coming. Governor Wolfram thought it odd that an admiral was addressing a captain as Sir. Was the man's reputation and mythos that powerful? Granger had become something of a legend in the past two months, as he was able to repel invasion after deadly invasion. The man seemed to have a knack for dealing with the swarm. Not to mention his inexplicable return from the dead. The Constitution had disappeared. The satellite cameras had broadcast the event to the entire Earth. One moment, she crashed and disappeared into a singularity, taking out three swarm carriers with it. And the next moment, she'd reappeared, careening through the atmosphere. That's right, Admiral. The warrior's it. Silence fell on the previously busy command center. He heard an officer cough nervously behind him. One ship, Wolfram thought. One ship against ten swarm carriers. The man is mad. Admiral Asbill was becoming agitated. Granger, is this a joke? Your fleet is right behind you, I hope, for all our sakes. In case CENTCOM didn't update you, we've got ten swarm carriers incoming. Ten. Granger leaned in slightly to the view screen. No joke, Asbill. They've got ten carriers, but we've got your entire planetary defense fleet, one ISS warrior, and one me. Governor Wolfram almost missed it, but Granger actually winked at them. The man had style. And balls. I'd say the odds are about even. Chapter 2 New Dublin, Air Sector, Bridge, ISS Warrior Captain Granger nodded toward the comm officer on duty to cut the transmission and swirled his chair to face Proctor. You ready, Commander? She nodded and stood up to leave. I'll get down there right away. It was always painful to have her leave. Fighting without Proctor was like tying your good arm behind your back during a fist fight. But he needed the coordination with the surface forces only she could provide. The woman had a knack for getting things done, quickly and efficiently. And besides, excluding himself, she had the most experience fighting the swarm. Her capabilities would be the most valuable directing the response of the rest of the Defense Forces' planet side. He swiveled back to his station. Should be just like Tau Ceti, he said. Swarm will never know what hit them. She paused at the door. Tim, this is hardly like Tau Ceti. We fought four ships there. We've got ten incoming. But New Dublin's Defense Force is far more capable than Tau Ceti's. True, she conceded. He glanced over at the tactical station, motioning to Lieutenant Diaz, the tactical officer, to join him. Don't worry, Commander. The bastards will never know what hit them. This time tomorrow we'll be back to planning Operation Battleaxe. Proctor stayed at the door a moment longer, then left. He knew what she wanted to say. You're being too cocky, Tim. She'd warned him several times over the last few weeks. She thought he was being too overconfident, too brash. And the truth was, he felt it. His confidence brimmed over, and he knew. He just knew he was going to crush those bastards. 
Ever since he'd woken up on Proctor's shoulder as she carried him down to engineering in a flaming constitution, careening through the atmosphere. Ever since the cancer had left. Ever since those missing three days, or fifteen seconds, depending on how one looked at it. Somehow, the miraculous nature of the circumstances, and the fact that he and Proctor had almost single-handedly saved Earth, granted him the knowledge that they'd be okay. They would survive. More than survive, they'd win so convincingly that the swarm would either never attack them again, or be wiped out so utterly that the win would amount to a genocide. And Granger was okay with that. That vague feeling, that voice in the back of his head, it gave him confidence. Swagger. He didn't stifle the swagger. On the contrary, he flaunted it. His people ate it up. They needed it. Craved it. And in the aftermath of the invasion of Earth, he'd gained, and cultivated, an almost legendary status. The Hero of Earth. He found that by acting the part of the legend, his people responded in kind with legendary performance. He acted the part for them. They wanted a hero? Then by God he'd give them one. If it meant the swarm would be destroyed and humanity saved. Helm! Report! Ensign Prince, whose red, raw face just recently emerged from the bandages that had covered the severe burns he suffered during the previous week's engagement with the swarm, cocked his head to the side in answer. Assuming a low orbit, we'll be swinging around the limb of the horizon just as the swarm arrives, sir. Perfect. He glanced to the side. Tactical. All magrails primed and ready. Any more trouble with the new ones they installed last maintenance? IDF had upgraded the warrior with over 100 new magrail guns, more than doubling her complement. That meant over 500 new crew members to manage and worry about but it was well worth the extra firepower. All power conduits are reading normal. Looks like Rain has got them all under control. A voice chimed over the comm system. Captain, my baby's ready for you. Treat her nice or I'll be grumpy tomorrow. Speak of the devil. He cleared his throat and raised his head. Thank you, Commander Scott. Your baby's my baby. Um, uh, sir. He could hear the smirk in her voice. A married woman. You can't marry a ship, Raina. Granger out. He smiled and swatted at the comm button. He glanced at the new communications officer, a young man straight out of the academy. Top of the class. Ensign Prucha. Is Proctor down there yet? Prucha checked his console and nodded. Just arrived a moment ago. Good. Once you do have a system link set up, we can get this show on the road. He checked the status board, confirming that all crews were ready for combat. One more senior officer to report in. As if on cue, a patrician British voice chimed over the comm. Captain Granger, all fighter crews ready. All four hundred? I'm still amazed you found a way to pack that many in there, Commander Pierce. The CAG's calming accent contained the smallest quiver. Desperation is the father of genius, sir. He hesitated. Will we be deploying all fighters this time around? Pierce, while being the best CAG Granger had ever served with, still hadn't recovered from the loss of his father, who'd commanded a British warship before encountering the initial swarm invasion force. Or was it deeper than that? Could it be that the other man just couldn't live with losing his pilots? As captain, Granger knew it was never easy. They lost a handful of people in every engagement. The flight academy could hardly keep up with the attrition rate. Granger could understand the man's concern. But this was not a time for hesitation. All fighters, Commander. Will that be a problem? A brief silence on the other end. No problem, sir. All fighter squadrons reporting ready. Good. Granger out. He thumbed the comm off. He gripped his armrests, suppressing the rising tension. Playing the part of swaggering hero for his people was one thing. Fooling himself that the upcoming battle would be a cakewalk was another entirely. This would be the battle of his life, and while he was confident they would prevail, he knew he'd lose people. A lot of people. And New Dublin would face heavy casualties, too. It was unavoidable. War was hell, and modern space warfare was fiery, brutal hell on an epic scale. The time ticked by. Granger busied himself with the last-minute details of battle preparation, 
but it was all window dressing. They were ready. The guns were primed, the missiles loaded, the lasers powered. All they needed was a target. Sir, coming up over the limb of the planet now. Visual contact with the swarm fleet. Shelby, I hope that was enough time for you, he said under his breath. Diaz gawked at his screen, waving emphatically at Granger. Sir, detecting thirteen swarm capital vessels. Thirteen. Damn. Chapter 3 New Dublin Air Sector Planetary Command Center Proctor dashed down the loading ramp of the shuttle as soon as it was safe, rushing abruptly past the commander who'd been sent to receive her and making her way briskly toward the command center. Granger's idea. Show them with urgency who was in charge and who'd be calling the shots, even though she didn't know where the command center was. Commander Proctor! said the short man, running after her. His uniform was too tight, as if he were someone who vainly and stubbornly clung to his older, smaller clothing, despite gaining fifty pounds. Please keep up, Commander, she replied, without slowing or turning around. With no idea of how to get to the command center, she needed him to catch up faster, but she wasn't about to slow down to wait. He huffed, breaking out into a jog, falling into step alongside her. Commander Proctor! Why did CENTCOM only send the warrior? She looked askance at him, raising a single eyebrow. Actually, Commander, CENTCOM wanted to send in the warrior's whole strike force. Captain Granger convinced them not to. Proctor almost laughed as she saw the man's jaw drop a full inch, but she kept moving ahead until she reached a T in the hallway that forced her to slow down momentarily to await his direction. But why? She saw a sign pointing to the command center and quickened her pace, now that she no longer needed his assistance. Two reasons, both of which the captain already told Admiral Asbill. He felt the strike force was needed in the Johannesburg sector, and he's confident that the combined strength of the warrior and the New Dublin fleet will be more than sufficient to meet the threat. But, but that's, that's just mad. The man looked flustered his thick face turning red, either from the jogging or disbelief at what she was saying. Mad? Probably. You'll find that Granger's tactics have become a bit... unconventional as of late. But he's also effective. We've actually got great odds. And just what do you place the odds at? They passed the doors to the command center, which opened right in time to receive them. Oh, twenty-five percent? Thirty? Hard to tell. She was kidding, of course, but the expression of dread spreading over the commander's red face was priceless. The real odds were far higher. Fifty-fifty, just like Granger had said. But he'd had an incredible streak of luck the past few months. Maybe this was the battle that would restore some balance to their track record. Admiral Asbill greeted her with a curt nod. Commander Proctor? Although he projected the confidence befitting a senior commander, she could discern several subtle signs of stress. He squinted. His eyes flicked between her and the status screens on the wall behind her. He was in over his head, and he knew it. But he was not about to let anyone else know it. This could be tricky. She needed operational authority if they were going to pull this off. But he might just be the type to stubbornly refuse. Admiral Asbill. I'm honored to be here. Captain Granger has spoken very highly of you. He asked that I coordinate the warrior's efforts with your forces. The experience we've gained engaging the swarm will be best implemented if I assist you directly down here. She translated in her head. Granger asked that I come and take over your fleet so you don't, in his words, piss away our victory and kill us all. She looked him up and down. A career IDF man. Probably served at a desk job for ten years in the old Miami HQ, deep in the bowels of the bureaucracy. Most definitely not one tactically adept bone in his body. Commander, what in blazes is Granger playing at? We don't stand a chance against that fleet and he knows it. We just detected an extra three ships Q-jumping in to join the other ten. And all CENTCOM sends is one ship as backup. He waved his arms, clearly agitated. He was absolutely right, of course, it was insane. By all rights, they should have arrived with an armada of ships to repel a swarm incursion of this size. But they couldn't spare them. Operation Battleaxe depended on it. 
If Granger was right, that plan would put an end to the swarm threat forever. They just had to survive the next few months before they could implement it. Admiral Asbill, I understand your concern, and I share it. But believe me, we can do this. Just give me operational authority down here, and by the end of the day we'll be clinking glasses down at the local pub. His eyes narrowed and she could feel him fume. Commander Proctor. She held up a hand. Fine. Keep operational authority. But please, allow me to coordinate your forces with the warrior. And I promise we'll pull through. She paused, watching the officers all around her. They were desperate. Death was visible on their view screens. Thirteen dots converging on their position so rapidly that they'd barely have enough time to mount any kind of effective response. They needed hope. They needed a legend on their side. They needed the hero of Earth. She continued, Captain Granger promises we'll pull through. Believe me, if it were anyone else, I'd say retreat as fast as possible. But that man is more than just some washed-up fleet captain. He's a genius. Pure grit and genius. If anyone can save us, it's him. The words felt hollow and stale in her mouth. He was, after all, just a man. A man who made mistakes and bad calls just like every other officer in the room. But that's not what these people needed to hear. It's not what they wanted to hear. And besides, he really did have grit. Grittiest old bastard she'd ever met. Admiral Asbill nodded. Fine. I'll keep operational authority. He nodded to all the officers scattered amongst the stations in the command center. But you are all to do as she says. He turned back to her and waved an arm to the command station. Commander, after you. She didn't skip a beat. Direct three of your frontline ships to make a point-blank, full-throttle charge against the incoming fleet, all weapons firing at full spread, targeting their lead ship, magrails to puncture, Lasers to rip into the wounds. The ensigns at the comm immediately began chattering into their headsets, relaying instructions to the planetary defense fleet, while Admiral Asbill sidled up to her, still nodding at the comm station as if to confirm her orders. Commander. Three ships. They'll be slaughtered. Proctor pressed her lips together and nodded once in answer. Maybe not. But it's part of the strategy. Not only will it soften up their lead ship for the war here, but it acts as a feint. We've been conditioning the swarm for two months to expect certain strategies, giving them patterns to look for and adapt to. Admiral Asbel lowered his voice. You're engaging in psychological warfare with a species that we know nothing about. On the contrary, we know something very important about them. And what is that? She glanced at him with a gallows humor wink. That they want us dead? At all costs. Chapter 4 New Dublin Air Sector Bridge ISS Warrior Thirteen ships Aware that every head was turned toward him, watching and scrutinizing his reaction, Granger shoved his fear deep into a corner and forced a smile, standing up slowly and clasping his hands behind his back. Calmly. Deliberately. Give them a good show, Granger. Good. An extra three ships to beat the shit out of. Full thrust, Ensign, bring us in hot. Be ready to execute maneuver Granger 1. Every head turned back to their station, brimming with confidence. You could feel the energy in the room. The bridge crew worked with a seamless discipline and coordination. It was showtime. Any word from Proctor? Granger glanced at his command console, scanning for signs the new Dublin defense fleet was taking orders from his first officer. Aye, sir. Three new Dublin ships are converging on the swarm fleet one minute until direct engagement. Granger nodded. Good. Proctor had things under control on the surface. Now it was time to make sure the impending sacrifices of the day would not be in vain. Time until maximum weapons range. Weapons range in 70 seconds, said Diaz. Commence fire when ready, replied Granger, sitting back down. Aye, aye, sir. He glanced at the clock. Sixty seconds. Fifty. Forty. Another stirring speech? 
There was still time, given his tendency toward brevity. No, they were ready. Another quick readiness review of the weapons crews? No, only thirty seconds left. That would take at least another five minutes. Twenty seconds. The swarm fleet began to resolve on the screen, shifting from pixelated blobs to menacing, multi-nacelled behemoths that were already disgorging thousands of fighters. The three New Dublin ships have engaged the swarm, sir. He watched the screen as the three sacrificial lambs plunged swiftly into the fray, forcing the swarm fleet to suspend its approach to New Dublin and deal with the defenders. But despite the new iridium armor plating and the upgraded smart steel defenses, which now worked much better thanks to a reset of the modulation frequencies that the swarm had somehow decoded for their first run at Earth two months ago, the defenders sustained punishing fire and the lead cruiser burst apart in a dazzling, sickening bright blast. In weapons range, sir. Fire! Every magrail gun aboard the warrior blazed as hundreds of high-velocity projectiles leapt out from the hull and slammed into the nearest swarm vessel. The view on screen pulsed with brilliant explosions as the slugs rammed into the other ship, which began disgorging fire and debris as the magrail projectiles ripped through its hull. Retarget! Hit the next ship with the mag rails. Laser crews, target the hulls in the first. Aye, sir, came the reply from the tactical station, and Lieutenant Diaz coordinated the new orders. Granger glanced at the clock, cringing as he realized the time was nearly up for their first pass. The ship rumbled and jolted as the swarm fleet understood it was being attacked from a new vector. Granger watched on the view screen as the enemy vessels grew large, then began to shrink as the camera switched views indicating that the warrior had sailed right on by the pitched battle. The ship rumbled a few more times as the swarm ships managed to fire off a few more shots. The viewscreen flared up with an intense green glow every time the deadly pulses made contact with the hull. But soon the other ships receded completely from view, falling behind the limb of the planet as the warrior continued its blazingly fast orbit around New Dublin. Right. First pass complete. Time to second he said, turning to navigation. At this speed, six minutes. It wasn't fast enough. They'd planned on ten ships, not thirteen. Increase thrust to one G, aft. Ensign Prince swiveled in his chair to look at Granger with a raised eyebrow. But, sir, that will require a steady increase in thrust radially inward toward the planet. That'll take us over the safety threshold within three minutes. You heard me, Ensign. From deep within the deck plates, the ship groaned as it tried to keep up with the increased gravitational stresses. Granger placed his hand on the console. She was no constitution, but she was just as good. He didn't want to openly admit it to himself, but she was actually a whole lot better, given her extensive refit after the battle over Earth two months ago. ETA now three minutes, sir. Now the swarm? Have they resumed their course? Ensign Diamond at sensors studied his readings. Yes, sir. The three ships in the first wave are destroyed, but the second wave is intercepting now. He suppressed the pit in his stomach. No time to feel guilt. No time for remorse. There was only time to survive. After survival, there would be time for luxuries. Luxuries like feeling. I'm just heading to meet them. His fingers drummed the seconds away. On the screen, the planet rotated serenely, almost blissful in its apparent ignorance of the destruction and carnage occurring far above its peaceful atmosphere. New Dublin was a beauty, for sure. Green and blue and cloudy. Why in the world the swarm wanted this planet so badly? Enough to send thirteen ships against it made him wonder. The planet and the sector held modest strategic importance. It was relatively centrally located. It had some resources, but no more than any other average world. It was almost identical to the other three planets being assaulted today in the swarm's four-pronged attack. But the fleet attacking it was the largest by far. What was he missing? Ten seconds, said Prince. Granger shook his head. There would be time for solving mysteries later. He would make sure of it. Fire! Chapter 5 New Dublin Air Sector
Planetary Command Center. Admiral Esbill, the Praxis, the Harrier, and the Crenshaw report engagement with the Swarm, reported an officer at the tactical station. Asbill furrowed his brow. Where's the warrior? Proctor motioned him over to one of the command stations she'd commandeered. Take a look, Admiral. She pointed to the tactical schematic. The warrior, still advancing under the cover of New Dublin's horizon, was bearing down on the pitched battle with blazing speed, far faster than a regular orbit at that altitude. She's orbiting at a 2x low orbital speed. In a few seconds, the swarm will never know what hit them. He frowned, pointing to the area on the screen where the invading fleet had momentarily stopped to deal with the three New Dublin ships. But what about the... One of the dots disappeared and Asbel's hand jerked away. Sir, we've just lost the Praxis. Asbel pounded Proctor's command console. Damn it, Commander. There were five hundred people on that ship. The tactical officer called out again. The Harrier is reporting hull decompression. They're not going to make it much longer. The thirteen swarm vessels have them completely surrounded. He typed in a few commands, and the view on the screen that comprised one of the walls of the command center was replaced by the camera feed from a satellite passing the field of battle. The Harrier and the Crenshaw flitted in and out of the enemy ships, targeting all their magrails and lasers on the cloud of fighters belching out of the swarm carriers, moving between the massive vessels as quickly as possible, just as Proctor had instructed them. Their job was to interdict and impede, at the expense of their lives. And they were doing a hell of a job. The fleet of swarm ships buzzed like an angry bee's nest. Here she comes, murmured Proctor. The satellite's camera angle widened, and from the right side of the screen, the warrior blazed in, all guns firing, making a ferocious dive for the swarm ship in its sights. And Proctor grinned. The swarm ship was getting the snot beat out of it. Multiple deep gouges sprouted in its starboard hull, which exploded as the warrior's laser crews trained their guns on the erupting wounds. A second swarm ship soon found itself on the receiving end of the warrior's guns, and the next moment she was gone as she disappeared behind the limb of the atmosphere, leaving destruction in her wake. Admiral Asbill paused, his mouth temporarily gaping open. Lieutenant! Status of those two swarm ships. Some fumbling with the controls, and a moment later the woman replied, No active energy readings from that first ship, sir. And reading massive power failures and structural integrity fluctuations in the second, though it is still firing at the Harrier. A moment later the satellite's camera, just before it passed out of view, revealed the remaining swarm ships descending on the Harrier and the Crenshaw in a tide of green antimatter pulse beams. The Harrier exploded and the camera cut out. Fine. That's one and a half enemy birds out of commission. He turned to glare at Proctor. But at the cost of three of our best ships. Three ships that we just tossed out there as cannon fodder. Over fifteen hundred officers and crewmen. She met his gaze and held it. Yes. Three ships. We've tried one, but they don't stop for one. They don't stop for two. They stop for three, and so three is the number we sacrifice, so that the rest of us have time to fight. The room fell to a quiet murmur as she spoke. The statistics were grim, sobering, ghoulish. But they all knew she was right. The unspoken historical statistics were far more grisly. At Earth, two months ago, over thirty of IDF's best ships fell before they'd even made a dent in one swarm vessel. She swiveled toward the tactical station. Send the next three from their holding pattern in low orbit. Direct intercept course, same as before. The officers at the tactical station paused and looked to Admiral Asbill, who, frowning, finally nodded. This had better be worth it, Proctor. Or an alarm started blaring, and Proctor didn't have to ask what it meant. On the wall's viewscreen, from the camera of one of the ships approaching the swarm invasion fleet, she saw the telltale bright shimmer. They had initiated a forced quantum singularity. Chapter 6 New Dublin Air Sector Bridge ISS Warrior The shimmering spheres hovering amidst the invading fleet could only mean one thing. 
Fortunately, it was the last thing Granger worried about at that point of the battle. Commander Pierce, deploy all wings. Aye, sir. He turned to navigation. Ensign Prince, full reverse. Slow us down for direct engagement. The ensign keyed the commands in, and Granger could feel the scarcely perceptible sway of the internal gravity field as it adjusted to keep up with the changing inertia. It was strange. During his brief battle with cancer, one that he should have lost, he could feel every turn, every imperceptible shift. Even the slightest change in acceleration had registered with him on a visceral level. Something about the tumor in his brain had affected his balance, but in turn had let him detect even the slightest change in momentum. Now that was all gone. He was healed. Whole. But how? The mystery had remained unsolved, and frankly he didn't have time to sit around philosophizing about it. Especially right now. An alarm blared and he chided himself for his momentary lapse into thought. The flashing indicator on his board told him they were nearly there. All gun crews, prepare for Operation Granger 2. He glanced at the tactical stream relayed from the planet by Proctor, mentally crossing his fingers that she'd managed to set up her end of Operation Granger 2. He did a last-minute check of their capacitor banks. Eighty-five percent. Good enough. Sir, contact with thirteen New Dublin ships. They're rising up through the atmosphere below and behind us. Granger smiled. Good work, Proctor. Continue breaking maneuver and open fire on my mark. He watched as the blips on their sensors grew larger and then the view screen on the wall split to reveal the thirteen new Dublin planetary force cruisers soaring up through the atmosphere like comets. Ultra-compressed gas streamed out behind them as they accelerated to speeds far greater than what was considered safe and prudent for an atmospheric ascent. Within another ten seconds, he supposed, all of their exterior guns would be useless, just as their sensors, cameras, and anything else attached to the exterior hull were all long burned away by now but it wouldn't matter. All that mattered was the sacrifice of those skeleton crews, and what that sacrifice would accomplish. Adjust speed, Ensign. Keep us right between our boys down there in the swarm. Aye, sir. He raised a hand, finger pointing toward the screen, poised to give the fire order. He glanced at the tactical readout. Five more seconds. Three. One. Fire! All the mag rails opened up, unleashing a storm of high-velocity slugs on the still-advancing fleet. In response, half the swarm vessels returned fire. Over a dozen green beams lanced out, slamming into the warrior head-on. The ship rocked and the deck plates bucked. Break! Hard, Ensign! He sat down and grabbed his armrests, but didn't buckle his restraints. He'd ride this out like a captain on an old sailing ship, buffeted by hurricane-force winds. The warrior slowed dramatically, and everyone aboard the bridge lurched forward as their momentum caught up with the ships. And from behind the warrior came the New Dublin fleet, hulls still glowing faintly red from their destructively fast ascent through the atmosphere, accelerating like bullets toward the swarm ships. All the green antimatter beams ceased, and for a moment Granger could almost imagine the confusion on the faces of the swarm upon seeing the thirteen ships blaze out of nowhere until he remembered that they didn't have faces. What the hell did they have? It was a mystery he knew they'd have to figure out before they would have any chance of permanently defeating their enemy. They had to be more than blobs of green slime. All enemy fire now directed at the new Dublin Planetary Fleet Task Force, said Lieutenant Diaz. For all the good it'll do them. He watched as the thirteen ships approached their targets. No more than seven seconds away they continued to accelerate. One exploded under the intense onslaught of the antimatter beams, then another. Each ship, or fragments of a ship, careened closer to its target, each one dwarfed by the massive swarm carriers looming ahead. A voice scratched over the comm, Admiral Asbills. I said better work, Granger. Even a high-velocity suicide run by one of our heavy cruisers won't be enough to destroy a swarm ship. We don't have to destroy them. Just watch, Admiral. And it was time. Two more heavy cruisers had exploded into fiery pieces, but it was too late. Each one found its target. Each plowed into a swarm vessel, 
initiating massive explosions that made the enemy ships shudder and convulse. The explosions were insignificant compared to the sheer size of the swarm carriers, but it wasn't the size of the explosion that mattered. It was the location of the explosions. Lieutenant! He turned to the tactical station, eyeing the men at sensors. Diaz's eyes darted over his readouts, and he nodded. Confirmed. All main fighter bays destroyed. Granger leaned back and smiled. Commander Pierce, scramble fighters. Get rid of those singularities, then beat the shit out of the capital ships. He raised his head. Admiral, feel free to deploy the rest of your fleet. Target at will. A silence. Granger supposed the man was deciding whether to cuss him out for losing sixteen of his largest ships, or acknowledge that the odds were suddenly far more even. There are still fighters coming out of those things, Granger. I fail to see- Granger broke protocol and interrupted. Each carrier has several fighter bays, yes, but the main one holds over seventy-five percent of their craft. Moreover, compromising their hulls in this fashion disrupts whatever they're using to block our lasers. Their ships are now vulnerable to our full suite of weaponry. What was before an unwinnable battle is now tipped slightly in our favor, but by no means won. We need the rest of your fleet out here, now, Admiral. Target their weapons batteries first, then move on to the next. Rinse and repeat. Another brief silence. Very well, Granger. Osbel out. Granger raised an eyebrow, then turned back to tactical. Target every single gaping hole with lasers and open fire. Boil the bastards from the inside out. Send out some nukes for good measure. With pleasure, sir. He glanced back at his command console, looking for the timer that would indicate when the first singularity weapon would most likely launch. Damn, less than a minute. And there were six of them. Each one capable of completely annihilating the largest city on New Dublin, and the town surrounding it for hundreds of miles around. The fighter pilots would have their work cut out for them. Chapter 7 New Dublin Air Sector Low Orbit Lieutenant Tyler Ballsy Voles pushed his fighter's throttle to the limit. Thankfully, the morning's hangover was a distant memory, and he was ready to kill stuff. The more stuff, the better. The swarm carriers loomed ahead, forbidding and threatening, in spite of the fire and debris gushing out from their midsections, where the main fighter bays should have been. Enemy fighters buzzed around them like bloodthirsty insects, but not nearly as many as there would have been without the sacrifice of those thirteen cruisers. Space Champ, on me. Pew Pew and Fodder, take the wings and prepare to deliver your cargo. He glanced at his sensor map. Bogey engagement in five, look sharp. Before he focused on the enemy fighters bearing down on them, he risked a glance to his side, toward one of his wingmen. Pew Pew, who'd replaced another nameless pilot Balls had lost the week before, held a tight formation despite the bulky cargo strapped to the undercarriage of the craft. The cargo. A brick. A brick of solid osmium. Only about two meters long and one wide, it was easily twice the mass of the rest of the fighter and therein lay the key to their best defense against the unthinkably destructive swarm singularities. Mass. Enough to close one of the miniature black holes before it launched toward the surface, or the warrior, or whatever else the swarm targeted. From within the cockpit, Pew Pew turned his head briefly and gave Ballsy a thumbs up. And with that, the alarm rang out, indicating enemy weapons fire in close proximity. It was time. In a tightly coordinated and thoroughly practiced maneuver, all four of them dove down, split off from their vector, curved out in a tight loop, and converged on a new vector, the nearest singularity. They ignored all the fire strafing across their path. Watch your three o'clock, fodder, Balsy said. He pushed his fighter into another tight loop, trying to shake off a bogey who'd latched onto his vector. Pew pew, I need help here, he started to say, but a muted explosion out of the corner of his eye cut him off. Already taken care of, Ballsy. Pew pew, said the other pilot, adding his customary sound effect. If there was anyone that liked to shoot stuff more than Ballsy, it was Pew Pew. He grunted an acknowledgement, then redirected his sights back on the glimmering singularity. They were remarkable things, really. 
no bigger than a smaller than average grain of sand, but the swirling glow of infalling material extended out several centimeters, and was so bright that it could be seen for dozens of kilometers around. While not massive, it nevertheless would rip apart anything that got within a meter, absorbing its mass and growing even larger. And it was toward one of these monsters that Balsy now accelerated. One of the shimmering beasts that had swallowed Fishtail whole. Jessica Miller. He knew her name. All of it. He still had nightmares where she fell into a fathomless black pit and the only thing he could see was her contorted face screaming out for him. He was half tempted to accelerate further and plunge straight in. Fishtail had done it, on Commander Pierce's orders and Granger had done it himself and returned just fine. If the old man could do it, why couldn't Fishtail? He wanted, desperately, to believe she was just on the other side. Her fighter hobbled and broken down, waiting for someone to come retrieve her. Balsy, what are you doing? The voice was a woman's. Fishtail? No, she was dead, of course. It was Space Champ, who was tailing him, escorting him and his cargo to the monster. Balsy, pull up! He stared at the pulsing light directly ahead. He could almost feel its gravitational pull increase, though the rational part of his mind knew that was impossible this far out. But he was plunging in toward it with alarming speed. Why shouldn't he go in? Why shouldn't he go save her? He glanced at the picture sticking up out of a seam in the dashboard. A small boy. Her boy holding a miniature toy model of a space fighter, the same fighter that Fishtail had piloted to her death. Ballsy! He closed his eyes and pressed the release trigger, and immediately he felt the mass of his fighter decrease by two-thirds as the osmium brick flew toward the singularity. With a jolt, he pulled the flight controls up, veering away from the beast at the last moment. With his maneuverability suddenly restored, he pushed hard on the accelerator, darting his small craft away from the singularity like lightning, and moments later it exploded in a piercing white blast. Glancing behind, he confirmed it was gone. What the hell was that, Ballsy? That was way too close, Space Champ said, clearly irritated. Last time I launched too early, the comrades blasted the brick before it hit. Just wanted to make sure it went in this time. Space Champ snorted. By sticking your bloomin' nose into it? Seriously, Balls, it's like you've got a death wish or something. He shrugged. Death would be a relief these days. Non-stop engagements. Nearly daily skirmishes with the swarm. More flight missions than he could count. Little sleep, severely rationed food. And the friends. All the dead friends. Pilots he'd get to know for a few days before they were snuffed out by relentless swarm fire. Death? Not today, Space Champ. He glanced at his sensors. Of the six original singularities, four had been dissipated. The other squads, however, were being harassed by enemy fighters. We've still got two more of these bungholes. Looks like squads Delta and Wolf need help with theirs. Fodder, Pew Pew, Space Champ, on me. Let's go blow shit up. Chapter 8 New Dublin Air Sector Bridge ISS Warrior The rest of the new Dublin Planetary Defense Force descended from their higher orbit and joined in the fight. Granger nodded in approval as he watched them engage the swarm, taking heavy damage, but dealing out their share too, wantonly blasting at the antimatter cannons dotting the surfaces of the swarm carriers with magrail and laser fire. The debris field was so dense that the paths of the normally invisible laser beams glittered with intense blue light. Tactical. Focus on those three ships at 28 Mark IV. They're still capable of singularity generation. The warriors' magrails showered the three swarm carriers with thousands of slugs, while dozens of IDF fighters engulfed them in small weapons fire. And soon the three hulls were ablaze with fire and debris spinning off into the deadness of space. It was going well. Very well. Far better than he'd hoped especially given that there were thirteen swarm ships instead of the expected ten. The warrior, her fighters, plus a few dozen heavy and light cruisers from New Dublin and their fighter wings, were pulling off what would have been thought impossible a few months ago. A victory. 
an almost easy victory. But with the smart steel armor now capable of enduring more than two blasts of the swarm's antimatter weapon, the odds for each battle were now far greater than they'd been over Earth two months prior. Victory, yes. But it reminded him of the cost. The sacrifice. He'd written off the lives of the crews of sixteen entire ships. Used them as bricks. The Bricklayer. That's what Scuttlebutt said his new nickname was these days. Hero, yes, legend, sure. But a butcher, who wantonly threw his people's lives away so that he could keep fighting? Damn it. No, he couldn't think about that. No hesitation, no worry. Only focus. Thinking otherwise would make the sacrifices all vain. And the treachery. They had a traitor in their midst. No other explanation could satisfy why updating the smart steel algorithms two months ago was enough to make it suddenly effective against the swarm's fire. Someone was collaborating with the enemy. Someone up top. They're on the run, sir, Lieutenant Diaz said with a wide smile. The remaining five ships are pulling away. Slowly. Their drives seem to be damaged. Granger nodded. Good. Order pursuit. None of those five get out alive. He scanned his sensor readout. And the first ship, the one we disabled on our first pass? Still in high orbit, sir, but it looks like they've fixed their drive, and they've set a course out of the system. He nodded again. Just as they should. Relay orders to the new Dublin fleet to ignore that one. Proctor should have taken care of it, but we need to be sure Admiral Asbel understands that- Sir! Ensign Prucha waved a hand. Admiral Asbel is on the comm. He doesn't sound happy. Speak of the devil, Granger sighed. Patch him through. The angry voice boomed over the speakers. Granger, what in the hell are you playing at? Granger kept his voice neutral, in spite of his desire to blast the comm speaker with his sidearm. Admiral, why are you letting that carrier escape? Are you batshit crazy? Batshit crazy? Granger grinned. Sounds about right. I had a plush retirement planned down on a Florida beach, and somehow I let Zingano convince me to stay on for another tour. Asbel huffed. A Florida beach that no longer exists, Tim. The lower peninsula is gone. The panhandle's a wreck, almost uninhabitable. Tens of millions dead, and our asses out here are on the line because of these swarm bastards, and you're letting it get away. I am, and you should too, Granger replied struggling to keep a dangerous note out of his voice. Excuse me, Captain. Granger stood up. I have direct orders from Fleet Admirals in Gano. We are to ignore that carrier. It poses no threat to us and will be allowed to escape. A long pause. I don't believe you. Osbel out. Granger's eyes widened and he swore. Sir. The flagship and several more New Dublin cruisers are pulling off and laying in a pursuit course for that first carrier. Granger spun toward navigation. Ensign, intercept course. Full speed. Head them off. It was the key to the whole operation. Save New Dublin? Fine. More than fine. Millions of people lived down there. But save humanity? Even more important. But until they knew where the Swarm homeworld was, or for that matter any swarm planet, all they could ever do was defend. Defend and lose. Strong defense never won a war by itself. Without an actual offense, the war was as good as over. That carrier had to get away. Granger glanced down at his command console and confirmed. The warrior had launched a small tracking device on its first pass, and it had attached itself to the swarm carrier's hull. It now streamed a constant, low-power telemetry signal. And when the carrier Q jumped away, Granger would know exactly in which direction it had jumped and how far. But he couldn't tell Asbill that. The plan was highly classified. Only a handful of his bridge crew even knew about the tracking device, and of his senior staff, only Proctor knew the full plan. Hell, even he didn't know the entire plan. Zingano and President Avery were holding that pretty close to their chests. But he knew it involved him. Finally, going on the offensive. And he'd be damned if he'd let some stuffy, ego-inflated admiral deprive him of the joy of going on the offensive against the swarm. 
Time. Ensign Prince glanced at his navigational board. Two minutes. They wouldn't get there in time. On his own sensor readout, he saw that the new Dublin ships were nearly there, less than thirty seconds away. A swarm carrier wouldn't survive more than a few dozen Padawatt laser blasts. He turned to the comm. Patch me through to the flagship. After a moment, Ensign Prucha nodded. Your on, sir. ISS Galway, stand down. I repeat, stand down. On fleet, Admirals and Gano's authority himself. There's still five ships to take care of down in lower orbit. Plenty of ass-kicking to go around. I repeat, stand down. Granger drummed his fingers on his armrest. No response. The first magrail slugs shot out from the bow of the new Dublin flagship. Damn it. He watched as his hopes melted away with every slug that collided with the hull of the swarm carrier. All the sacrifice and loss that day wasted. If that enemy bird didn't get away, if Warrior couldn't track it, they'd be back at square one. They'd allowed half a dozen swarm ships to get away over the past month, and they'd managed to zero in on a few quadrants of space out toward Ursa Major. But it was still far too much space to search through planet by planet. They needed to triangulate better. And for that, they needed at least a few more swarm ships to escape. Reading massive internal explosions in the swarm carrier, sir. Granger debated telling Asbil over the comm why they were letting the carrier escape. But no, far too risky. If the swarm overheard that conversation and transmitted it back to their homeworld through a metaspace signal, then it was all over. IDF would never learn where the swarm was coming from, and humanity would be pounded relentlessly into submission, then oblivion. He had to block that magrail fire. Ensign, move the warrior in between the cruisers and the- Captain! Granger spun around to the sensor station at the officer who'd just yelled. The man's face was flustered, bewildered. What? said Granger. More ships, sir. Reading ten? No. Fifteen new signals. Damn it. Swarm. The officer screwed up his brow. I... I'm not sure. Visual. The officer nodded and punched in a command. Granger turned toward the viewscreen at the front of the bridge. It flickered, changing views from the bombardment of the hobbling swarm carriers to the newcomers. Not swarm. Not IDF either. Russian? Chinese communion? Ensign Prucha called out from the comm. We're being hailed, sir. Video feed. Granger nodded for the man to put it up on the viewscreen, and within a moment, he found himself staring at something he'd thought he'd never see in his life. Aliens. A man, or at least a head, attached to a vaguely reptilian torso, looked Granger up and down before opening its mouth. It spoke only one word, and Granger didn't even think to wonder at the fact that it spoke English. Leave. Granger paused as he tried to process what he was seeing and hearing. The alien spoke again, this time leaning in threateningly toward the screen. Its voice twisted in an accent that spoke both of its difficulty with English and its utter foreignness. It was definitely other. Leave or die. Chapter 9 New Dublin Air Sector Low Orbit Even though the main fighter bays of the swarm carriers had been destroyed, it seemed that several hundred craft had surrounded the remaining two singularities in an attempt to blockade the sabotage runs. A storm of weapons fire flared all around Balsey and his crew as they angled through the melee. Delta Squad is gone. Beta Squad is on its way. Our orders are to run interference for them until the package is delivered. Balsey cranked hard on his control stick and dove down through a formation of enemy bogies, letting Pew Pew and Fodder savage them with two streams of rapid-fire ordnance. Space Champ picked off the stragglers. Spatters of rapidly freezing swarm goo streaked across Balsey's viewport. A few moments later, Beta Squad arrived, and Balsey and his crew careened toward a dozen bogies converging on the newcomers. It seemed the swarm knew exactly which fighters posed their superweapon the greatest threat, 
as they targeted the fighter with the osmium brick attached to its undercarriage. Pew Pew and fodder, peel off and take out the wings. Space champ, cover me. No problem, boss. And ballsy, remember, don't fly like my brother, said Pew Pew. Yeah, well, don't fly like my brother, replied fodder. The two fighters sped away in opposite directions. Two brothers, each headed toward half a dozen enemy fighters. Don't fly like my brother. They actually were brothers, something Ballsy had figured out only recently. They always said that when they were in a morbidly cavalier mood, something that came when they faced down hopelessly dangerous situations. Ballsy scanned the wings. There were more bogeys than Ballsy had initially realized, and he was suddenly worried that he'd sent them to their deaths. Fodder was always complaining about that, hence his call sign. But a sick certainty hit Ballsy as he became sure he'd finally sent his fellow pilot to his death. Yet there was no time to worry. He was in the midst of them now, and a sudden jerk told him he'd been hit. But the damage was light, and before another slug could connect, he looped around in a tight curve, allowing Space Champ to blast a few bogeys that had started to tail him. He finished the loop and ended up on her tail, returning the favor, as she'd taken on two shadows herself. Ballsy, you're hit said Space Champ. He craned his neck around and saw the smoke billowing from his right wing. Technically, he didn't need the wing, so long as he didn't have to re-enter the atmosphere. But if the internal pressure was compromised, or if the starboard stabilizers were damaged, he'd have a hell of a time in the coming minutes. Testing his maneuvering thrusters, he satisfied himself that he was good to go, when suddenly the world seemed to explode. My hit? Damn! He couldn't even see. A whooping cheer made him realize that it wasn't him that had been hit, it was the singularity. Beta Squad had delivered its package. He breathed a cautious sigh of relief. Why are those bricks made out of osmium anyway? said Space Champ as the light from the explosion died down. She was often distracted by details like that, and Balsey hated it when she wondered things out loud in the heat of battle. How anyone could be distracted during such an intense situation was beyond him. He shrugged the question off, but Fodder answered for him. Comes from the asteroid mining ops. They use all the other heavy metals and ship hulls, but the osmium's useless. They just dump it all out in the asteroid belt. Well, now they finally got a use for that crap. Balsey sighed again in relief. Hearing his voice meant that Fodder was alive. He scanned his readout looking for Pew Pew, but didn't see him. He squeezed off a few rounds at a stray bogey as it passed and searched the field of battle for their next target. But isn't that shit poisonous? Osmium? Space Champ continued. Balsey was half tempted to reprimand her for distracting them, but before he could say anything, a fireball exploded right behind him. A bogey, caught in Space Champ's deadly sights. Damn, the girl was good. Guess she could wonder about trivia and blast comrades out of the sky at the same time. You seen Pew Pew, Space Champ? He pulled hard left to avoid running into the smoking skeleton of an IDF light cruiser, then wrapped around hard and blasted two bogeys trailing fodder to oblivion. No. Nope. He craned his neck around again, searching for Pew Pew. Fodder, where's your bro? No, no, man. Fodder's voice sounded nonchalant, at ease, as if his brother had just gone outside for an evening smoke. Those two had far more confidence than Ballsy. Hell, what had happened to him in the last two months? He was distracted. His confidence wavered. He was nothing like the balls-to-the-wall young space jock he remembered being after graduating from IDF Flight Academy. He glanced back at the picture of Fishtail's boy holding the toy fighter propped up on his dashboard. She had happened. He couldn't stop thinking about her. About her son. About that day he'd told the kid his mom wasn't coming home. The whole experience had knocked him on his ass. It surprised him. He was the battle-hardened space jock. He lived for the thrill. He didn't get hung up about women, and he didn't get hung up about lost friends. But he was hung up. The new orders flashed up on his console. Engage the carriers. Commander Pierce's voice blared over his comm set in confirmation. All birds engage the remaining carriers. Fly interference for the new Dublin cruisers. Ignore the fighters as much as possible. Focus all firepower on the carriers. Cag out. Damn. 
They'd have to track down Pew Pew later. You heard him, boys and girls, he said, peeling hard to the right and setting his attack vector on the nearest swarm carrier. It was just a kilometer away, billowing smoke and debris as the warrior pounded a gaping hole in its side with nearly invisible laser beams. They may have been invisible, but they would incinerate his fighter within a second if he strayed too close. An antimatter beam lanced out from the carrier and slammed into the warrior, followed by half a dozen more beams. One of them shot out and caught a new Dublin cruiser right in the bow, initiating a massive explosion that rocked the ship as it passed. Fodder's voice came over the comm. Let's go pick off those turrets. Greed, replied Balsy. Space champ, back us up. Aye, aye, Balsy, sir, Captain Lord Commander. Her voice was playfully ironic. For a moment it reminded him of fishtail. Hell, it seemed everything was reminding him of fishtail these days. Fighters reminded him of fishtail. Sleeping and breathing reminded him of fishtail. They dove in, streaking and zooming back and forth to avoid the incoming fire from the enemy bogies swarming them. He tried to remember Commander Pierce's lessons. The CAG held a weekly training session for the seasoned pilots, and they'd just had one that morning. Keep it random, he'd said. If you're predictable, you're dead. He bounced back and forth, up and down, as randomly as he could, bobbing and weaving through a cloud of fighters, picking off the occasional target as often as he could, but keeping his heading toward the carrier. At last they were there. Send a torpedo at that tower, Fodder. Space Champ and I will cover. Fodder's fighter leapt forward. A dozen or more enemy fighters careened toward him, and Balsy shot around them in a gut-wrenching high-G loop picking them off one by one with Space Champ who matched his moves. Fodder managed to thread his way through the melee, though Balsy didn't see how. The cloud of bogies was thick. This was possibly their most hopeless and deadly skirmish yet, even though the sacrificial cruisers took out over three-quarters of the enemy birds in their own fighter bays. A lone torpedo blasted off from Fodder's left wing and slammed into the antimatter beam tower, even as a green beam lanced out from the turret and slammed into a passing IDF cruiser. The cruiser and the beam turret simultaneously exploded, and Balsy flinched as he soared through the expanding cloud of dissipating debris. Oh, yeah. On to the next, partner, said Fodder. They blasted away toward the next tower, halfway down the length of the carrier, and cringed as they saw the dozens of bogies swarming around it. Apparently, they were expected. Right, Balsy began. Nothing for it but to... Fodder didn't wait for Balsy to finish. He accelerated toward the swarm of fighters, guns blazing. Yee-haw! Careful there, Fodder. Don't take your call sign literally, said Space Champ. Babe, this is how I got my call sign. Full speed ahead, bitches! He plunged right into the thick of the horde, swerving and blasting them to pieces. A handful of slugs caught his tail and wings, but he kept on looping and firing. Balsy swore and plunged in after him, Space Champ close behind. He took a hit. And another. Damn. This was going to be his last flight he knew. I'm hit. Space Champ screamed into her headset. Losing control. Balsy watched as a pair of fighters bore down on her, pelting her with several more slugs. But he had his own bogeys to deal with. They were going to die. Out of the corner of his eye flashed a bolt of shining metal, weapons fire screaming off its turrets. It was missing its right wing, and Balsy wasn't sure how it was still navigating. But sure enough, it looped around and picked off Space Champ's tails before shooting straight at Balsy, who dropped low for it to pass, and as it streaked by, it nailed two of his own trailing bogies. Hot enough for you? came Pew Pew's voice. Balsy sighed in relief. He was still alive, and so was Fodder's brother. Unlikely as both events seemed. I told you don't fly like my brother, said Fodder, who had punched his way through the melee and now launched another torpedo at the second turret. It exploded in a convulsive blast. The four of them peeled away toward their next target. Where the hell is the warrior? asked Space Champ. Balsy glanced at his scopes, and sure enough, it was gone. Only a few dozen New Dublin cruisers, and all of Warrior's fighters could be seen pounding away at the five remaining swarm carriers. Chapter 10 New Dublin Air Sector Bridge, ISS Warrior 
Captain Granger bolted out of his seat. The sight of the individual on the screen, obviously not human, yet speaking Granger's own language, spurred him to action, or at least to tactically stall until he could find out who or what they were dealing with. Who am I speaking to? No answer. The person on the screen stared at Granger. The eyes reminded Granger of a cat, slitted, dilating, and then shrinking in response to some stimulus Granger wasn't aware of. Slowly, dangerously, it bared its teeth. Yellow, spiked teeth that looked like they could cut a man's neck clean off. Who are you? This is Earth territory and this planet is under our protection. I advise you to- The alien interrupted. Stop your attack on our ally. Then leave. You have... It paused as if thinking or considering its words. Sixty seconds. Granger stared at his opponent, then motioned to the comm. Admiral Esbill, now. Ensign Prucha nodded and frantically called into his receiver. Moments later, Admiral Asville's voice once again came through the speakers on Granger's station. He motioned to the ensign to mute the audio on the alien's video feed. Admiral, are you seeing this? Yatim, Asbel replied. Those Russians with masks on? No. This looks like the real deal. Ship design is completely foreign. He glanced at the intel station to be sure, and the officers there all shrugged. We've got nothing on these guys. You? Asbel cleared his throat. Negative. Granger looked at the countdown timer one of the tactical crew had enabled on the front view screen. They had less than twenty seconds to comply. Twenty seconds to see if those fifteen new warships were as dangerous as they looked. Allies with the swarm? The idea boggled his mind. If it was true, it could derail their entire war strategy. Admiral, we've got to hold fire on that fleeing carrier. Let's see what these people want, who they are, what they're doing here. After a short pause, Asbill swore. Fine. I'll send word up to the Godaway. You're close to them. Got a full sensor workup. Full sweep, all frequencies, neutron scan, metaspace monitoring everything. We need to know what we're dealing with. Granger nodded, and after a quick glance to Lieutenant Diaz, to make sure the tactical crew was on top of the scans Admiral Asbill had ordered, he motioned back to the comm to unmute the alien's audio. He looked back up at the vaguely reptilian man, at least he assumed it was a male, on his screen. We have complied. We no longer attack the swarm vessel. The alien looked to the side, probably to someone off camera for confirmation. Then, turning back, he rested his hands on the table in front of him. Now, leave. First, I want to know who you are and why you've come. Granger knew it would take at least a few minutes for the scanning crews to get anything approaching a useful data set, so he'd have to stall to give them enough time. We have come to our allies' aid. Who we are is not relevant. It is relevant, sir. As this is our space and you are the guests, it is not polite to withhold your identity from your host. It was difficult to read the alien's facial expressions, but to Granger it looked as if the other man scowled. Guests. We are not your guests. We are your adversaries. You are enemies of our ally. The Valarisi have been our friends for... Time. For all time. You will submit to them if you are wise. Continue to resist them at your peril. Valarisi? Was that what the swarm called themselves? Odd that after seventy-five years and two devastating invasions, they hadn't even learned the name of their foe. And you? What do you call yourselves? We are Dolmasi, of the Concordat of Seven, the first allies and friends of the Valarisi. Granger stroked his stubble. Concordat of Seven? What is that? Are there more civilizations than the Dolmasi who are friends with the Swarm? What are your intentions toward us? The alien smiled. 
at least as good an approximation of a smile as the face could manage. Granger couldn't tell if it was a natural expression, or if, like the alien's ability to use English, the rudimentary facial expressions were a learned skill. Ah, intentions are to stand by our allies. Our allies wish to bring you into submission. So that is what we will do. We are the second house of the Concordat of Seven. We and our brothers will bury you unless you lay down your arms, abandon your ships, and welcome the most high Valerissi, the first house of the Concordat of Seven, onto your worlds with open arms. Granger's fist clenched behind his back. He had half a mind to order a magrail bombardment right then and there on the lead vessel and teach these people a lesson. You did not come barging into Earth's territory on the swarm's behest and expect a warm welcome. But the exchange bought them some valuable information. Crucial information. The swarm could be negotiated with. Communication was possible. He tossed a questioning glance toward the sensor station at Tactical and the ensign in charge there. Ensign Diamond shook his head. Damn. They still needed time for their scans. They needed to know everything possible about this new enemy, in case they had to fight them. And might I ask your name, sir? The alien inclined his head. Vishkane Kharsa. I am Vishkane of this vessel, and all the vessels you see here, and fifty others. Vishkane. Granger repeated the word. It must have meant admiral in whatever language the Dolmasi spoke. I am Captain Timothy Granger of the ISS Warrior. The Swarm, uh, the Valerissi, as you call them, have invaded our space and killed our people. We will expel them. Do not make me expel you as well. The alien made an odd noise, almost like a grumble or a cough, and it took a moment before Granger realized he was laughing. Interesting. He'd taken the requisite course at IDF Academy for first contact, which included topics like xenobiology and xenosociology, and it never occurred to him that an alien would ever develop the social custom of laughing like humanity had. Or was this another learned skill again? And if so, how much had they learned? You are in no position to expel us. You command one ship that has the potential to harm us and another twenty that don't. He shot a quick glance at the sensor station and made a questioning face to the crew there. With a grimace, the ensign nodded. Apparently they'd had time to parse some of the sensor data and confirmed that the new enemy vessels did indeed pose a threat. A significant one, by the look on Ensign Diamond's face. Granger glanced at his tactical screen, at the fifteen ships that floated ominously just kilometers away, between them and the lone swarm carrier which had hobbled away at a fraction of its optimal acceleration. He wondered whether the tracking beacon had been damaged in the assault, and if the vessel would be able to Q-jump away. Perhaps not, Vishgane Karsa. Would you like to test that theory? I dare say many of you will not survive your encounter with the ISS warrior. He cocked his head toward Tactical and murmured, Ready antimatter torpedo. They'd never been fielded before. IDF Weapons Research Division had only given them a handful to test, but he suspected a regular nuke wouldn't be enough to scare them off. Another coughing grumble, and Vishgane Karsa spread his arms wide in what Granger guessed was a sign of confrontation. We care not for survival with the Valarissi as our ally. We sacrifice and die at their command, as is our glorious right. So you are slaves, then? A hiss. That sound and its meaning were obvious. Slaves? We are no slaves. It is our prestige and an honor to serve the Valarissi. We are the most honored and loyal of their allies. Interesting. 
Your allies seem to have about as much sway over you as a master to his slave. He nodded toward tactical. Give them a demonstration, Lieutenant. Z minus ten kilometers, right under their ass. Firing, sir. On the viewscreen, Granger watched as a small projectile shot away from the warrior, and it angled down from the bow until it raced away from them and approached a point several kilometers below the Dolmasi fleet. A shimmering green beam lanced out from the lead ship and vaporized the torpedo, and it erupted in a muted explosion, its antimatter pod apparently untouched by the detonation. Very impressive, Captain Granger. Granger cringed on the inside. Apparently, his opponent had not only mastered English, but sarcasm as well. We've got thousands more, he bluffed. Are you willing to take your chances? Leave now, and I promise we will allow you to escape without further violence. But if you stay, be prepared to... More coughing, laughter, and the Domasi Vishgane threw his arms wide again, this time even more aggressively. Now it is our turn for a demonstration, Captain. Prepare yourself if you can. Granger stepped forward and touched Ensign Prince's shoulder. Evasive maneuvers, Ensign. Tactical. He motioned toward the station. Full spread of RPO fire. Intercept whatever they're sending at us. Hi, sir. The tactical crew was abuzz with activity as the dozen or so officers coordinated the efforts of the rapid pulse ordnance crews down below. Granger turned back to his console to scan for whatever the Dolmasi were sending at them. He saw it, just as the sensor officer called it out. Sir, forty more ships just Q-jumped in. They're right on top of us. Chapter 11 New Dublin, Air Sector Bridge, ISS Warrior. More Dolmasi? Swarm? Granger asked. Ensign Diamond at Sensors shook his head, examining his board, and then smiled. But Ensign Prucha beat him to it. Sir, Fleet Admiral Zingano, aboard the ISS Victory, is hailing us. Granger relaxed. Finally. He watched the other vessel, almost a carbon copy of both the Constitution and the Warrior, sail into the midst of the confrontation. IDF's shipbuilding program had not only swung into high gear the past two months, it was several orders of magnitude past overdrive, as Earth's entire population, and that of dozens of other worlds, swung into a total war footing. Victory had only been spaceworthy for a week, but had already notched two wins. Three, if Singano had been successful at Centauri earlier in the day. Batch him through. A moment later, Zingano's voice boomed over the speakers. Looks like you could use a hand, Tim. Looks that way, Bill. Your arrival is... timely. Admiral Zingano grumbled. The assault at Centauri was a feint. They immediately pulled those ships back, and from their Q-jump vectors it looks like they were coming in your direction. Granger nodded. Thirteen showed up instead of ten. And it appears they brought some company. But our new friends seem to be making themselves scarce. Granger glanced at his tactical readout, and sure enough, the fifteen Domasi vessels were pulling back, falling into formation with the lone swarm carrier as if to escort it out of the system. Admiral Asbill's voice came over the speakers. Bill, they're getting away. They could Q-jump out of the system at any moment. We need to strike now while their backs are turned. No, Admiral, Zingano's voice replied. We have no idea what the capabilities of those other ships are. If they're leaving without a fight, then we're not going to give them one. Not without more tactical knowledge. But, sir, they've destroyed over two dozen of my best ships. Our safety depends on us taking out as many of them as- No, Russell. Your safety depends on following my orders to the letter. Or was that not clear when you accepted your Admiral's bars? End of discussion. Ensign Diamond caught Granger's attention. Sir, they've made their cue jump. All the Damasi ships are gone. He waited expectantly for the key piece of information. And? The swarm carrier? Gone as well. Please tell me the tracking beacon was still functional. Diamond tapped a few more controls on his console, furrowing his brow. He smiled and looked up. Toward Polaris, in the Jorgen sector. Granger turned back to the comm. You hear that, Bill? 
He could almost hear the other man smile on the other end. I did. I think that's enough for us to enter phase two of Operation Battle Axe. Admiral Asbill's voice blurted out onto the channel. He was starting to really annoy Granger. Operation Battle Axe? Why wasn't I told about this? Need to know, Russell. That shouldn't surprise you. But this is my world they've been attacking today. Governor Wolfram will want to know about your plans to maintain New Dublin security and... Singano interrupted, his voice approaching in patience. Russell, we're here to protect humanity. Inasmuch as that means protecting New Dublin, then that's what we do. But I do not share operational details of strategic plans with officers that don't have a need to know. Never have, never will. Is that clear? Now get your ass back onto New Dublin. I am on New Dublin, and organize your defenses. The Swarm don't like losing battles like these. You can bet your asses they'll be back within the week. It's their way. Zingano talked right over him until the other man fell silent. The war was clearly getting on everyone's nerves. But you include him in your plans? The man that came back? The friggin' bricklayer? The one who's probably a Russian agent? Don't deny it, Bill, even the president has her doubts. A long pause. Granger smirked at his bridge crew and a few of them smiled back. Zingano sighed. Almul Asbil, you're relieved. Report to IDF CENTCOM on Earth in two days. Your replacement will arrive then. Zingano out. The calm crackled, indicating at least one of the lines had terminated. Tim, you're still there, came Zingano's voice. Yeah, Bill. We need to talk. You, me, Proctor, everyone on the War Council that I trust. Interesting. Interesting that he included Proctor in there. And interesting that he distinguished Granger and Proctor from the others with the word trust. Trust was a rare commodity at CENTCOM these days. In spite of the total war footing and President Avery running the country and its associate planets like one giant wartime industrial engine. At the waypoint? Yes. See you there in one day. Zingano out. The waypoint. The secret coordinates that only a handful of people knew about. Granger, Proctor, Zingano, and only two or three other admirals. President Avery as well. He addressed Ensign Prince, but remained standing, facing the empty XO's chair. Get back to New Dublin. We need our fighters and our XO. All hands, stand down from battle stations. Commence repair and recovery operations. Chapter 12 New Dublin, Air Sector, Low Orbit Two carriers left. They had this one in the bag. Against all odds. Valls' face was sweaty and dripping. One of the hits his fighter had taken had knocked out the environmental controls, so the cockpit was overheating. Thankfully, his flight suit was fully contained and had enough oxygen to last at least a day. But damn, it was hot. His squad finished off the last antimatter turret on the closest carrier, and soon they were angling toward the remaining swarm vessel. Last call, boys and girls. Let's blow this bastard and then go get drunk and make very irresponsible life decisions. Too late, said Space Champ. We're already space jocks. Ballsy smirked. I'll have you know I'm an upstanding law-abiding citizen, ma'am. He pulled the trigger and picked off a stray swarm bogey. On his sensor screen, he noticed another fighter squad nearby getting raked over the coals by a cloud of enemy craft. On me, boys. Let's bring Striker Squad out of trouble there. They veered toward the melee, and Balsy recognized the voice as soon as it spoke. Thank you kindly, Balsy, said Dogtown, his old squad mate. The voice brought back searing memories of the former squad. Dogtown, Hotbox, Fishtail, Balsy. Two were dead, and two had death's number. Hang tight, Dogtown, we're nearly there. An explosion cut him off. A striker squad fighter erupted in a fiery cloud as swarm fighters strafed it in crossfire. Balsy swore, even as his own squad plunged into the fight, and ten seconds later it was over. He looked around at the field of battle and at his sensor screen. The last enemy carrier had been neutralized and was being pummeled by the IDF cruisers bearing down on it. A few dozen swarm fighters still flew around the cruisers and among their own fighters, but the operation was quickly becoming a mop-up. He noticed the warrior had returned from chasing down a swarm carrier and soon Commander Pierce's voice came over his headset. Well done, people. 
All craft return to Fighter Bay. Dogtown and Ballsy, your two squads will bring in the rear and watch for strays. Strays. It had become a common post-battle swarm strategy. Inevitably, there would be a handful of enemy fighters that would manage to elude them in the mop-up operation, only to reappear as they were returning to the warrior's fighter bay, harassing them and occasionally making suicide runs at the bay itself. Ballsy, came Dogtown's voice. You and your squad take aft and we'll take four. When everyone else is in the bay, I'll escort my two boys, and you follow in with yours. Roger, taking position now. He guided his team toward the fighter bay, patrolling the aft side of the entrance as the surviving squads made their landings. Ballsy was thorough, peering around every nook and corner for hidden swarm craft while scanning his sensor board for any contact. The swarm somehow were able to turn off all power and reduce all EM emissions to an undetectable level when in hiding, and the warrior was a big ship, with many places to hide, especially with so much debris floating around. That's it, folks, we're heading in, declared Dogtown. Balsey watched as he and his two surviving squad mates made their landing. Space champ, head in. Fodder, follow her. Pew pew. Can you even make a controlled landing with only one wing? I guess we'll find out, man, said Pew pew. Balsey watched with bated breath as Pew pew made his final wobbly approach, lurching and tilting as the pilot tried to maintain a straight course on landing. With a jolt and a shower of sparks, he made it skidding to a stop one hundred meters into the vast bay, nearly crashing into Fodder's craft and only stopping at the last second. He pulled the controls to guide his fighter into the bay. Balsy, bogey on your tail, Space Champ screamed into his ear. On instinct, he pulled up and looped around in a tight curve, nearly passing out from the extreme G-force pushing him into his seat. But it was worth it. With a flick of his thumb, he pelted the trailing bogey with a stream of fire, and it exploded into a satisfying muted fireball. Space Champ yelled in his ear again, There's two! Twisting his head around, he saw it. It had been hiding behind a large piece of debris from one of the destroyed IDF cruisers, and was now making a full-speed run for the fighter bay. Ballsy was way off course, having been distracted by the first. Damn it! He pulled hard on the controls and wheeled the fighter around, pointing it at the bogey descending full bore on the fighter bay entrance. His thumb unleashed a storm of fire on the craft. Many explosions ripped through the bogey and it was knocked somewhat off course, but moments later it managed to pull itself aright, and with what Vol supposed must have sounded like a horrific crunch and the shriek of metal on metal, it clipped the side of the fighter bay entrance and spun out of control, passing through the EM shield and tumbling onto the floor, colliding with people and fighters alike before it came to rest, smoldering and steaming. Chapter 13 New Dublin, IR Sector, Planetary Command Center Proctor had no sooner listened to Fleet Admiral Zingano dismiss Admiral Asbill when he'd fixed a cold glare on her and said, Get. Out. Several minutes later she was back on her shuttle, climbing up into the atmosphere toward the distant dot that was the ISS warrior. From her vantage point it looked like the battle was just a mop-up operation now, as all the swarm carriers were destroyed, and all that remained were a few dozen fighters. By the time the warrior was large enough to fill her window, it seemed all the swarm fighters had been rounded up and neutralized. Except one. She watched in horror as a stray bogey fired up its engines from behind a piece of debris and raced toward the fighter bay. One of their own pelted it with fire, but the enemy craft smashed into the fighter bay, leaving fire and destruction in its wake. Aboard landing in shuttle bay! Get us in there, she said to the shuttle pilot, pointing at the fighter bay. There was still plenty of room for them to land there, and she knew she'd be needed. Moments later, before the hatch had completely opened and angled down to the deck, she jumped off and ran toward the chaos. Broken bodies lay against a wrecked fighter, and blood was everywhere. From their uniforms, she saw one was a tech, the other a pilot. Other fighter deck crew techs were running with fire suppressants, as others dragged the injured away from the smoldering swarm fighter. Stay clear of it. All non-essential personnel, out. She reached down to check the pulse of a tech, but there was no hope for this one. Her forehead was caved in from where the crashing fighter had struck it. Colonel Hanrahan and his rapid response force arrived, along with a hazmat team, all of them helping to clear the space around the swarm craft. 
The characteristic green sludge was dripping out of holes and fissures. The colonel and two pilots assisted a third pilot, Dogtown, one of the few original space jocks they brought over from the Constitution. He'd been knocked over, but was at least standing with assistance. Came out of nowhere, said a voice behind her. She turned to see Lieutenant Valls. Ballsy, if she remembered right. Damn comrade just came out of nowhere. I, I tried to stop it, but... She grabbed his shoulders. He looked shell-shocked. This war was getting to him. It was getting to them all. Lieutenant, you did everything you could. I was out there. I saw it. If it weren't for you, more would be dead. He was vaguely shaking his head. The young man was clearly still in shock. If I had stayed a little closer to the bay, or if I'd targeted its thrusters instead of its power plant, or if I'd- Ballsy, she began, looking him in the eye. Listen to me. This is not your fault. Nobody here is at fault. When a killer pulls the trigger, we don't blame the victim for getting in the way. You did your duty, and you did it brilliantly. Look at you. You're still here, two months later. I think that shows that you're one of the best, the best we have. He shook his head. Not good enough. Not good enough. Not good enough to save her. Before she could ask what he was talking about, he continued. They're not killers, Commander. They're a force of nature. They're a hurricane, a tornado, an infestation. Calling them killers only grants them humanity. And they are anything but human. He was rambling, of course, but she conceded, internally, that it was a good point. She had to get to the bottom of this. IDF and United Earth were losing. Sure, they were racking up victories, but they were ultimately Peric victories. Hundreds of millions were already dead, and millions joined them every week. And the swarm were endless. They were a hurricane. A force of nature, Vols nailed it. Go get some sleep, Ballsy. She let go of his shoulders and turned him toward the exit. But before she could guide him toward the doors, the shuttle bay exploded again. She was knocked down by the force of a blast from behind. When she opened her eyes and looked around, several things stood out to her. The explosion wasn't nearly as destructive as she feared. It was only some minor blast coming from the swarm fighter, probably an overloading power cap going critical. But the other thing she noticed was far more disturbing. Colonel Hanrahan, Dogtown, and the two pilots helping him had been much closer to the fighter and were laying motionless nearby. And worse, green sludge was smeared all around them. Swarm matter had blasted out of the fighter and had sprayed out onto them. Hazmat! Get them isolated and cleaned, now! She beckoned to the suited hazmat crew who rushed to the fallen crew members. Thankfully, she saw all of the men move, so at least they weren't dead. But they might be far worse than dead. Chapter 14 Boulder, Colorado Earth Office of the Vice President Tertiary Presidential Bunker Vice President Isaacson knew many things, but the thing he was most sure about was that the office of Vice President was the most useless office in the world. Sir, President Avery would like to talk to you privately in her chambers. The aide called the news in lazily from his office, which was literally just a closet next to Isaacson's own office, which itself barely qualified as a room. He'd been moved out of his old, sprawling office building, and God, he missed that place. Lavish, finely decorated, right next to the fountains in the courtyard at the old North American presidential mansion, just outside the border of D.C., and far more private than his current setup. They'd moved him at President Avery's orders. Ever since that day, over two months ago, when the swarm attacked Earth, Avery would not permit him to be in the same room, or the same city, as her. Not out of any loathing or ill feeling she may have borne him, though he supposed she didn't hold him in any particularly high esteem, but there was security to consider. If a swarm singularity bomb were to hit the main presidential compound with Avery in it, at least the government would still have continuity of leadership. He was the fallback the contingency plan, the backup. But until that time he was needed, he was utterly useless. Troop inspections and morale parades were about all he was allowed to do. Now, the aide sipped his coffee before responding, the message says to be there in two hours. So basically now, 
It takes nearly two hours to get there. He glanced at his watch, then wistfully at the stack of reports and briefings piled high on his desk. He was not born for paperwork. He was born for hookers and tequila. And there was a disturbing lack of both in his new bunker of an office, here, buried underneath a mountain outside Denver. One hour, forty-two minutes, yes, sir. The aide tapped the compatch tattoo on his wrist. I'll arrange for your shuttle. By the time you get up there, it should be ready for takeoff. Fine. And get my new bodyman. That new intern, what's his name? Connor? Yeah, I'll need someone to arrange my coffee and accommodations when I'm out there. It's nearly five o'clock, so by the time I get there and meet with the old battle axe, it'll be well past my bedtime. And one does not keep little presidents in waiting up past their bedtimes, he added with an ironic drawl, mimicking President Avery. Twenty minutes later, he emerged from the last elevator out into the glaring winter sunlight and pulled his coat tight around him. The intern, a young man who'd been drafted only a month prior, was waiting for him, holding a heavier coat. Brought this for you, sir. Thought you'd need it. Nice touch. The kid was young, but not stupid. Thank you, Connor. Shall we? Isaacson thumbed in the direction of the shuttle waiting on the launch pad, engines whining in the background. Connor picked up the overnight bag he carried for Isaacson whenever his duties required him to travel. Usually he'd rely on whatever establishment was hosting him to see to his every need, even cater to his whims. But times had changed. Almost overnight, the world had changed. Earth and most other populated worlds were on a war footing. Not just a casual war, involving just the half percent of the population that ever volunteered for the military. This was total war. Entire industries co-opted by the government and re-geared to produce capital ships and fighters instead of cruise liners, missiles and torpedoes instead of personal vehicles, targeting computers instead of personal entertainment devices. Everything was different. The stakes were high, so Earth, and President Avery, had risen to the occasion. Have a seat, son, he said to Connor, motioning him toward one of the other passenger chairs. Soon they were in the air, blazing through the upper atmosphere at three kilometers per second. The noise cancellation system seemed to be down, and an unholy roar pierced the cabin. Sorry, sir, we're having maintenance issues, shouted the captain of the shuttle. A squat man with a mustache buckled firmly into his cockpit seat. Isaacson noticed no such restraints on the passenger seats. Delightful, Isaacson drawled. Are we going to make it in one piece, or shall I alert the Speaker of the House that he's next in line? I'm sure Mr. Lapierre will be overjoyed. A gruff laugh. Sit down, sir, and enjoy the ride. Be there in an hour, less if we can get through D.C. secure airspace faster than a turd through clogged pipes. Blue-collar workers. He rolled his eyes and focused on the data pad that Connor had pulled out of his overnight bag for him. Thank you, son. Connor nodded a brief smile, then closed his eyes, gripping his armrests tightly and apparently making a good play at relaxing. Are you nervous, son? The boy opened his eyes with a start. Sir? Nervous. Oh, it's just... I hate flying, sir. Understandable, you're young and... What are you, eighteen? Play sports, you look like a football player. Connor shrugged. Nineteen. And, yeah, I played my freshman year of college. No, sir, I've never had problems flying. N not until... Well, you know. Isaacson knew. The smoking craters were still smoldering from the heat of the blasts. Except for Miami. The Gulf of Mexico had flooded into that particular crater and most of New Orleans as well. But Houston, Phoenix, San Bernardino, and Riverside, they were desolate, craggy pits. Body like that, you should be in the Marines, son, or at least the Marines football team. Isaacson settled in to read through the latest casualty reports coming in from the day's skirmishes. It had been a busy week, over a dozen different swarm incursions. But each one repelled, half of them by Captain Granger himself, Gods, the man was practically a legend in his own time. Even half of the admiralty was eating out of his goddamn hand. And for what? It's not like the man was a god. He was no superhero. He was just particularly skilled at using his people and ships as cannon fodder. The brick layer. He rolled his eyes at the latest report. 
Thirteen state-of-the-art heavy cruisers used as battering rams, wasted, thrown away just so Granger could claim another stunning victory. Connor shrugged again. Yeah, I guess I could have been drafted into the Marines, but they sent me to the Administrative Corps instead. Don't know why. Studied political science in college, but only for a year, and bad grades at that. Too busy playing football. I figured someone was... He trailed off. Isaacson glanced up. Walls what? Never mind. Need anything else, sir? I could use a nap. Stayed up half the night. Gotta get your sleep, son. Can't stay up watching football games. The young man clenched his jaw. Apparently he'd touched a nerve. Just waiting for your call last night, sir. They told me to stay by my phone in case you needed me for the base readiness tour you were supposed to- Ah. Yes, sorry about that. I cancelled at the last minute. There's too many of those damned things. They do nothing but parade me around like a mascot, supposedly to build troop morale or some shit. Connor scowled, but closed his eyes and gripped the armrests again. Yes, sir. They traveled in silence the rest of the way, and true to the captain's word, they managed to fly straight through the controlled airspace above D.C. without any problems. The Airspace Commission bureaucrats had apparently finally coordinated with the bureaucrats down in the executive office and they'd coordinated with the Space Force pencil pushers. One big, happy administrative circle jerk. It was a wonder Earth was still standing. It is still standing because the swarm failed, and they almost didn't fail because of you. He shuddered and pushed the thought aside. It wasn't supposed to be this way. He was supposed to be president by now. Avery was supposed to be dead, and the swarm pushed back to their own territory. Ambassador Volodin had assured him that was the case. But Volodin had been recalled to St. Petersburg. Isaacson hadn't seen his old friend in two months. <laughs> friend. Erstwhile co-conspirator was more accurate. He looked out the window and saw the familiar, sprawling D.C. skyline extending to the horizon in all directions. Now apparently ten times its original boundaries, it was half the size of Maryland. With great galactic republics came great administrative responsibilities. The ship lurched. He glanced out the window again and saw their course had changed. Hey. What's up, Captain? Change of plans. Isaacson stood up. Connor looked to be asleep, so he moved past, taking care not to brush up against him. What do you mean, change of plans? He demanded. Sorry, sir, we've been given a new destination. There's been an explosion at the executive mansion. Isaacson's stomach lurched. Russians again? Were they still at it? He'd explicitly told Volodin right after the invasion that the plans were off. He was out of the assassination game. There was no time for shit like that with Earth's existence on the line. President Avery. No idea, sir. They just tell me where to fly and I go there. Order came from our chief of staff himself. Why didn't they tell him directly? Just like the president's staff to keep Isaacson in the dark. Her chief of staff was prickly, efficient, and had never liked Avery's veep. Where are we going? The pilot pointed to a spot on the map. Isaacson blinked. Not possible. Regardless, sir, that's where we're going. I triple confirmed. Thought my earwax had built up too much. The pilot's finger returned to the navigational controls, but Isaacson was still fixed upon the location on the map the man had pointed to. He sighed. Avery had apparently kept a lot of things from him, including secret bases in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Chapter 15 Atlantic Ocean, Earth Subsurface Presidential Bunker 8 It only took them another 45 minutes to re-enter the upper atmosphere and shuttle out to the coordinates in the middle of the Atlantic. By then it was dark, and all Isaacson could see out his window was the top of a sea of clouds illuminated by the nearly full moon. The captain's voice called from the cockpit. We're here, sir. Descending now. Hold tight. I've been told to make the descent quick-like. Leaf on the wind and all that. Isaacson had no idea what the captain was talking about, but without waiting for a reply, he sent the shuttle into a steep dive. The craft only had light-duty momentum cancelers, and so both Isaacson and Connor were forcefully thrown forward, and nearly ended up on the floor as the front of the shuttle pointed down sharply. Just as abruptly, 
They were then thrust back into their seats as the craft accelerated. Isaacson noticed Connor's white knuckles gripping the armrests and his wide eyes darting from the window to the cockpit and back again. Poor kid. Nearly there, son. Connor nodded quickly. Damn it, the kid was probably going to pass out from the G-forces pressing them back into their seats. Isaacson was a little unnerved himself, but at least he wasn't about to vomit. Connor's face, meanwhile, had turned an unmistakable hue of green. Tell me about yourself, son. Where are you from? Where's your family? The green face turned red. Miami, sir. Isaacson's stomach clenched. Ah, oh, shit. I see. I'm so sorry. Connor nodded his acknowledgement of the sympathy. I was at college, up in Massachusetts at the time. Kingsford College. They sent us to a bunker that morning, and since it was after finals, we decided to throw a little party. We had no idea it was a real invasion, thought it was a drill. Got pretty plastered. I... I felt the shaking. But I thought it was just the beer messing with my balance. Shit, sir. I felt Miami explode from over a thousand miles away. Isaacson glanced out the window. They had descended below the clouds, and all was pitch black. He hoped the captain knew what he was doing. I'm sorry, son. Yeah, I remember that night. I was in the Omaha Command Center. Wasn't dark yet there, but Connor interrupted, the memories apparently making him forget his manners. It was night up there, and I came out of the bunker at one point and looked up, south, toward the horizon. Saw flashing lights way, way up there. Saw something explode with a flash so bright I had to shut my eyes. Then something like a real slow meteor flying away from the flash. I... I think I saw the Congress go down. It was heading out toward the east, at least, so I think it was the Congress. Crashed out in the ocean, didn't it? Isaacson nodded. Damn it, if they were going to give him a neurotic basket case for an intern, couldn't they have at least made it some hot young thing in a miniskirt? And... and your family... They were in Miami at the time, said Isaacson almost absentmindedly as he stared out the window toward what he assumed was the surface of the ocean just a kilometer or two below. Where the hell was this secret base of hers? He immediately wished he hadn't asked. Connor's face screwed up, contorted with a valiant effort to stave off tears, but within a few seconds, to the boy's credit, he'd pulled it together. Good kid. Yeah. My brother was away at school out in L.A., but my mom, dad, two little sisters, yeah, gone. Isaacson had nothing to say, so he kept quiet. Soon the captain called back. Here we go, hold on. They both held firmly to their armrests as the craft decelerated at a stomach-lurching rate. Isaacson glanced out the window again, just in time to see a giant tube extend upward out of the water. Since the running lights of the shuttle were not powered, he supposed as a stealth measure, the only illumination came from several tiny red lights circling the rim of the tube. It opened, like a giant maw that grew frighteningly large as they approached. It swallowed them up as they passed below the level of the water, but he soon realized that the tube was water-free and extended deep into the ocean. They plunged straight down for several minutes, the walls of the tube now illuminated by the shuttle's internal cabin light. They stopped. Below them, another iris-shaped door opened, admitting them to a large bay. Several other ships were parked on pads, but no one waited to greet them. Follow me, said the captain after the ship had come to rest. He opened the door and led them into the giant bay, passing a ship Isaacson recognized as Interstellar One, the president's personal starliner. The lights were off, but the underside of the craft still radiated a substantial amount of heat so he assumed she had only just arrived, too. This way, Mr. Vice President. The captain waved a hand slowly past an ID scanner, and the bay door heaved open with a mechanical sigh. Odd. He assumed the man was just a simple taxi pilot, a self-styled captain of his own personal shuttle, but clearly his security credentials were of the highest caliber. They walked down a long, stark, poorly lit hallway, wet with condensation and soon entered what would have looked like a highly sophisticated command center, were it not for all the cots and cooler chests littering the room. It had apparently been lived in by a small army of presidential staffers. 
And there she was, right in the middle of her usual entourage, Chief of Staff Miller, a few ever-present aides, Congresswoman Sparks, her direct contact and hand in Congress, General Norton, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and of course her poodle, held by what he assumed was a bodyguard, judging by the sidearms strapped to the man's well-built chest. Amen, good you're here. President Avery strode over, abruptly cutting off General Norton and extending a firm hand for Isaacson to shake. A large turquoise ring bulged out from one of her fingers, the one piece of jewelry she ever wore. How's your bunker? Ha! <laughs> Look at us. Hiding like little girls while our enemies make plans behind our backs. You heard, didn't you? What's that, Madam President? He asked, falling into step with her as she pulled him by the arm toward a small office off of the main floor. When they'd all filed in and General Norton pulled the door shut behind him, she put her hands on her hips and regarded them all. All right, all of you out, just aiming. Give us a moment. Her entourage dutifully stood up and left. Isaacson glanced at Connor, who looked like he didn't quite know what to do with himself, and motioned with his head toward the door. When it was closed, she grabbed his arm again and pulled him in close. Someone is trying to kill me, Eamon. Someone on the inside, and they've very nearly succeeded today. He tried to look shocked, but before he could say anything, she pulled him in closer and whispered, And I think they're trying to kill you, too. Chapter 16 Atlantic Ocean, Earth, Subsurface Presidential Bunker 8 Avery looked him up and down, apparently watching for his reaction. After a moment, she repeated herself. Did you hear me? Someone is trying to kill me and you. You don't say, Isaacson thought with a slight inward smile. If Volodin was behind it, he supposed the other men would try to make it look like he was trying to take out both of them. Less suspicious that way. He tried to look serious. And concerned. She'd want to see him concerned. But why bring me here? I thought it was wisest to keep us apart, you know, for the sake of leadership continuity in case... He trailed off. In case the bastards shove a stick of dynamite up my ass? Ha! Huh. She turned and grabbed a chair, spun it around and sat on it backward. She was full of swagger, just like during her campaign. But the recent months seemed to have given her a rougher edge. Somehow, I doubt, he began circling the room, that someone is trying to kill me? That someone would use dynamite, he thought. He knew perfectly well there were plenty of people that wanted her dead, himself included. At least he did two months ago. He had to admit that with the national emergency, she had risen to the occasion rather dramatically. She'd been smirking, but her face turned serious and she pulled out a flask from her jacket. Look, Eamon, I've made a lot of enemies, you should know. I only chose you as Veep to get the Federalist Party out of my hair and appease half the people calling for my head. Oh, don't give me that look, we both knew that, let's cut the shit. Avery offered the flask to him, and after hesitating a split second, he accepted it and drank. Bourbon. Very well, Isaacson said. And I only accepted because I thought you'd be ousted in the first vote of no confidence within a year of the election, and I'd be fast-tracked for the presidency. Ha! Now we're getting somewhere. She grabbed the flask back and swigged. You bet your fat ass you were fast-tracked. Probably more than you knew. I knew there were rumblings for the vote, but I also knew I had the votes. The next one, though, who knows? She stopped the flask and tucked it away. But it's in the past. Times change. We woke up in a completely different world, you and I, two months ago. He nodded his approval. And you've done a singularly remarkable job, ma'am. Not good enough. She pulled the flask out, despite having just tucked it away, drank again and coughed. I appreciate the sentiment, but the truth is that we need to work together to survive. Not just my life, not just your life, but all our lives. She looked up at him, and he finally noticed the deep bags under her eyes. In spite of the no-nonsense, tough-as-nails, commander-in-chief persona she'd cultivated, she looked deadly tired. They're coming, Eamon. All these skirmishes are just feints. There's no reason they can't send two hundred carriers to Earth tomorrow and wipe us out of existence. He drummed his fingers on his cheek. 
Isaacson remembered the message the swarm had sent Ambassador Volodin during their brief fight on the Winchester during the Battle of Earth. You die. Terse, but to the point. And yet two months later they hadn't come. At least not in force and not to Earth. Volodin knew something. He knew a lot of somethings, none of which he'd told Isaacson, who decided right then he'd force it out of the ambassador, beat it out of him if he had to. He was almost sure the other man was under the influence of the swarm, but those last moments in the Omaha command center had convinced him otherwise. And yet there was still something off about him, something out of place. Why be so insistent on assassinating Avery, plot a convoluted scheme with Isaacson and President Malikoff to get rid of her, and then at the first failure retreat back to Russia with nary a word, and then supposedly make more attempts on her life without telling him? It didn't make sense. Amen, she began. There are senators, governors, congressmen. Many of them hate me, yes, I understand that. It's politics. But there's a group of them plotting my death. For whatever deluded reasoning they've conjured into their vacant brains, they think I'm a threat. Even before the emergency, they wanted me dead. Is it because of my past, my policies, my vagina? You know some of them can't stand seeing an uppity woman grab them by their political balls and squeeze unless they do my bidding. They hate it. They hate me for whatever reason. He nodded. He agreed. In fact, he'd been one of them. For months, he'd met secretly with over a dozen of them, plotting the overthrow, scheming ways to get her out of office. Only a handful knew of the plans to kill her, but he knew there must have been others that shared the sentiment. Will you help me? We need to find them, root them out before it's too late, and believe me, Eamon, in a few months, maybe even a few weeks, it could be too late. He closed his eyes and sighed. I will help, Madam President. I'm friends with several of the factions, and dozens of senators owe me favors. I have a few thoughts about who it could be, but I'd rather keep that to myself for now. Give me some resources. Secret Service, Intelligence Service. With my contacts and their... Methods. I'm sure we can nail a few of these bastards. She stood up and reached out for his arm with a warm, vulnerable smile. She was so charismatic, endearing. No wonder she'd won two elections outright with no runoffs. Thank you, Eamon. I knew I could trust you. He gripped her hand in return. And I'm honored to have your trust, Madam President. Oh, Madam President, my hairy ass. Call me Barb. She laughed again and pulled the door open, waving her entourage back in. General Norton walked right up to her, about to speak, before glancing uneasily at Isaacson. Go on, General. Mr. Isaacson has clearance. What is it? The old soldier grumbled. Madam President, I've just received word from the expeditionary force, following up on Granger's most recent lead. That caught her attention. She grabbed his arm. And? We found one. A Swarm World. Chapter 17 The first thing he noticed were two blindingly bright lights above him. Was he on the Constitution? No, the color was off. The lights in sickbay were warmer, inviting, healing light. These were cold, almost blue, harsh. One was bigger than the other. He tried to move. It was hard. His limbs didn't want to cooperate. It felt like moving through a pool of crystallized honey. But eventually he managed to lift his head. He was in a room. Small. A few more tables, some unfamiliar medical or technical instruments scattered on workbenches by the wall. The strain was too much. He let his head fall back against the table and just stared at the lights. Hours seemed to pass. Days? But when he lifted his head again, he knew there were people in the room. Friendly people. Or enemies? It was all so hazy, the faces indistinct. He fell asleep again, and when he awoke, he realized he could move his limbs. They were finally mobile. The pain had gone. But he felt someone in the room behind him. He lifted his head to get a better look. Chapter 18 
The Waypoint, near Sirius. Bridge, ISS Warrior. Captain Granger bolted upright in his bed, gasping, hands clutching at his chest. The tumors, the cancer, the wilting pain, was it back? He breathed deeply, then whirled around to glimpse the person he knew stood behind him. But the room was empty. It was just his bedroom on the warrior after all. The nearest people were the two marines standing guard outside his quarters. It was a dream, just a dream. But it seemed like more. It felt so real, so immediate and tangible and... He shook his head. Was it possible? Was he remembering his ordeal? His vacation, as gossip on board called it? The dreams were occurring with increasing regularity, always the same, always hazy and incomplete and distant, like he was watching a film through blurred glass. But they were becoming clearer. They were becoming memory, not dream. Damn it. He had to remember what happened to him. He felt like their lives depended on it. Sir, just a few more Q jumps away from the coordinates, said Ensign Prucha over the comm. He shook his head again to clear it. I'll be there in a minute, Ensign. Thank you. There'd been no reason to change out of his uniform when he slept at night. There was never the need. The swarm incursions happened with such regularity that he found it far more convenient to only change when he showered. And so, minutes later, he settled into his chair on the bridge as a yeoman brought him his morning coffee. Was it morning? He glanced at the clock and realized he'd only slept two hours. The ISS warrior snapped into existence in an unremarkable area of space, just two and a half light years away from Sirius. The star shone brightly on the view screen, easily the most luminous object visible. Granger cocked his head toward the sensor station. Anything? Ensign Diamond shook his head. Nothing yet, sir. Granger stood up and nodded. Very well, looks like we wait. Just like Avery, always keep people waiting said Proctor. Granger eyed her wryly. You don't like her, do you? Proctor shrugged. She's my commander-in-chief. Doesn't matter whether I like her or not. But you didn't vote for her. I declined to answer. Proctor tapped her console and changed the subject. Admiral Zingano should be here momentarily. He was going to make a brief pass through the Proxima system, just to review readiness there, but that shouldn't take him long. We need all the time we can get to make these repairs. Granger examined the reports on his command console. How's the hull repair coming? The main hole on the bow has been patched. That blast took out two whole magrail guns and a laser turret, so we'll have to completely replace them. We've got a dozen of each in storage, but it'll take the crews a week to install them. The rest of the hull damage is lighter, but it will still take us about a week. Granger shook his head. Too long. We need to be on the move. The next engagement could come in a week, or it could come tomorrow. If we get in a fight tomorrow, we may not last long, sir. Especially not if it's thirteen swarm carriers like today. It was right, damn it. They'd have to lay low for a bit, or at least choose their engagements more carefully. Nearly three weeks of almost daily skirmishes had taken their toll. In fact, they were due at Churchill Station in the Britannia sector to pick up replacement fighters and pilots. The losses were harrowing. Thirty-five more pilots gone, including their birds, along with some support staff that had been standing in the wrong place when that enemy bogey slammed into the fighter bay. We'll try to keep a low profile for the next few days. Besides, I think I have an idea about what we'll be doing, and it hopefully won't involve flying into the middle of large formations of swarm ships. She nodded, and before she could question further, Ensign Diamond called out, Sir, the victory just Q-jumped in. Ensign Prucha added, Admiral Zingano on the horn, sir. Batch him through. The Admiral's voice blared over the speakers. Long time no see, Tim. Avery should be along any minute now. Had a few last-minute meetings on Earth. You heard about the latest attempt on her life? Granger leaned forward. No, I hadn't. I was trying to kill her. Swarm? Do they have agents on Earth? That's what we're trying to get to the bottom of. And that incident with the Dormacy at New Dublin. Well, that just confirmed what we suspected. That the swarm are able to manipulate and control. How the bastards do it as a damn puddle beats me, but Avery is not leaving things to chance. 
He's left the capital and is running things from a series of secret command centers. Is it the Russians? Could they be controlled somehow? It was a dangerous question in a way. It reminded everyone that he, too, had been in some sort of mysterious contact with the Russians during his disappearance. And if the swarm could control, and if the Russians were under their influence, then he had to tread carefully. What if he was under their influence? It was unthinkable, but it was something to consider. Don't note him. We've made diplomatic progress recently with Marakov to get more support with the war effort. At first they tried to pull the neutrality shit, but we reminded them of what happened last time they tried to sit out a war. Granger shook his head. I can't believe we're thinking about trusting them. Look around you, Tim. We're in a bad place. We can use all the help we can get. He shrugged. Yeah, but I don't have to like it. The arrival of Interstellar 1 and the two escort missile frigates interrupted them. The three ships blinked into place, the stately, sleek presidential ship hovering in between two equally sleek, but deadly-looking military vessels, packed to the teeth with weaponry. Granger knew they were basically mini-constitutions, almost solid blocks of tungsten, but about one hundred times smaller, and with a crew of fifty. The hulls were so thick and the mag rails so numerous that there was only room for that many. One captain and forty-nine gunners. The president took her safety seriously. Incoming transmission from the president's ship, sir. Conference call to both us and victory. Visual. Badge it through. Granger turned to the view screen and smiled at the two people who appeared. Fleet Admiral Zingano and President Avery. Except she looked odd. A little more haggard, a little different. Had she changed her hair? No, that wasn't it. Admiral, Captain, she nodded. Shall we meet aboard the Victory? Admiral Zingano grunted. Not quite finished building the ship yet, Madam President. We've got a hull and weapons, but that's about it. We'll come to you. Very well, Admiral, see you soon. Her half of the screen blanked out. Zingano gestured up at the screen. She looks tired, doesn't she? Granger raised an eyebrow at Zingano. Tired? More like a different person. She needs to get out into the sunlight more. So do we all. You'd look like an albino Tim if it weren't for your scruff. Don't you shave any more. Granger grumbled. It's been a busy week. Killing comrades takes precedent over my grooming. The Admiral chuckled. Well, when this is all over, I'll have time to court-martial you. He thumbed to his side. Come on, let's get over there. The image blinked out, replaced by a view of Interstellar One and its escorts. And then the escort ship to the left of President Avery's vessel exploded. Chapter 19 Atlantic Ocean, Earth Subsurface Presidential Bunker 8 An actual, live, honest-to-God swarm world. At least, that was what General Norton had claimed last night. The scout ships had found the impossible, an entire planet imaged at a distance from the edge of its solar system. No resolution, of course, but spectrographic analysis indicated the definite presence of swarm matter. Isaacson shuddered. At least that hypothesis was confirmed. The swarm was, in fact, liquid. More coffee, he said absentmindedly. Connor jumped up and poured out another cup, and Isaacson paged through the stack of security reports his new contacts at the Secret Service had given him. Reams of paper detailing illegal activities among the staff of several key senators, a few of which he knew very well from his many meetings with them planning Avery's demise. His own chief of staff, Hal Levin, sat across from him. Isaacson tossed him a piece of paper. Look at that. Senator Quimby. The service caught him embezzling campaign funds. So? Levin asked lazily, glancing over the papers. Everyone does that. Yes, but look at where the money came from. Avery's own fundraising operation donated a sizable chunk toward his re-election. She thought she could sway him over on the Eagleton Commission decision. In return, he not only voted against it, but spent her money on a new mansion in Hungary. Idiot. Levin scanned the paper while absentmindedly holding his mug out to Connor, who refilled it. Quimby looks like he's hit some hard times. 
Most of his businesses were folding even prior to the war, and now, to add insult to injury, they've drafted every single one of his kids. All five of them. Isaacson snorted. His fault for having kids. He sipped his coffee. Too hot, no sugar. Damn it, Connor. Plus, everyone's kids have been drafted. Yes, but he's a senator. He could have pulled strings. True, Isaacson said, spooning sugar into the coffee slowly, looking over the next document. But they've been 